and welcome to Rewildology, the podcast that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. When was the last time you updated your travel bucket list? I'm sure lots of our destination fantasies change after being stuck indoors for two years. Luckily, many countries are welcoming back tourists after being shut down from the pandemic. One of these countries is a beautiful island with species found nowhere else in the world. Countless documentaries have been made about its unique wildlife and stunning landscapes, along with the struggles its people have faced for generations. What island am I referring to? Madagascar the land of lemurs. Since few of us can book a last minute flight and two week tour across the island, today I'm bringing you with me on a tour across Madagascar with a woman so passionate about lemurs that I'm sure you'll want to hop on a plane and see the island just as badly as me. To guide us across Madagascar, in this episode, we are sitting down with Lynn Vinart, co-founder of the Lemur Conservation Network. Lynn's story into this field is inspiring and quite winding. Trained in user experience and digital design, Lynn fell in love with lemurs after watching a documentary about shafakas and did everything she could to travel to Madagascar to see them for herself. After successfully visiting the island, she returned to the U.S. with a newfound passion to raise the voices of the people dedicating their lives to protecting lemurs. After hours of research, she found the IUCN Primate Specialist Group's recommendation for saving lemurs and realized that they didn't have an online presence to spread their message. So, on a whim, she reached out to the group and asked if she could build that online presence, and boom, just like that, the Lemur Conservation Network was born. Now, in 2022, LCN is a fully functioning nonprofit and an online network that fosters collaboration among conservation organizations in Madagascar while inspiring animal lovers to support the cause. Lynn and I discuss everything lemurs as well as their top threats and how to conserve them. We then go on a full tour across the island, meeting the species and people she's come to love. If you're not watching the YouTube version of this episode, Lynn and I do our best to give you a description of the photo she's sharing so that you can envision the trip along with us. If you're not driving and can safely visit the website, each image is listed in the show notes with a timestamp so that you can follow along. Additionally, if you want a hardcore science episode all about lemurs with two amazing Malagasy lady scientists, head on over to the archives and check out episode 51 after listening to today's show. All right, friends, please enjoy this very interesting tour across Madagascar with Lynn of the Lemur Conservation Network. Well, hi, Lynn. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today and traveling literally across the world from where we're sitting right now to talk about this very special group of animals that I am just so excited to have back on and chat about on the podcast. But before we get to all of that, though, what is your story? Why in the world have you dedicated so much to this group of animals called lemurs? How did all of this unfold? Take me to the beginning. Let's let's explore your story. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Actually, I have a pretty unusual path to conservation, so I think it's great to share it because I think a lot of people think that there's just one path to science or one path to conservation. So I hope that my story can inspire other people who maybe think maybe they don't have a place in conservation, but I would argue that everybody has a place in conservation. So I actually studied communications and art in my undergrad, and I also have a master's in nonprofit management. And I didn't even discover lemurs in Madagascar until right after I finished my undergrad and I saw a documentary on TV and it had Varose shafakas, which are a species of lemur that just have really long legs and they jump when they're on the ground. They jump on the ground the same way they would jump in the tree, like side by side. And I just thought they were the most amazing animal that I've ever seen in my life. And I could not stop freaking out about them. <laughs> so once I... I was like, what are these animals and where do they live? And what is this? You know, it was like a whole new world opened up into me. So I just wanted to learn everything there was to know about lemurs in Madagascar. 
And the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn. And so I was like so intrigued about Madagascar and lemurs, but I didn't have a science background. So I continued working in communications and digital design for 20 years. And I worked for nonprofits and museums as a user experience researcher and designer. And that means that I conduct audience research and I use what I learn from that research to design digital experiences online. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. That's so awesome. <laughs> all the while I'm doing this, I'm like, okay, I need to get to Madagascar. Like I need to st- like hang out with these lemurs a bit and see what's, you know, what's going on there. Finally, in 2012, I first traveled to Madagascar and it was just you know, it was a dream come true. I saw sifakas in the wild was my first species were cockerel sifakas. And, you know, just being so close to Madagascar and seeing it firsthand. And, you know, I went to several different national parks and saw several species of lemur and meeting Malagasy people. They were so friendly. And I felt like I learned so much more when I was in Madagascar and just talking to people than when I had just been like, scouring the internet and scouring books and everything like trying to figure out all I needed to know about Madagascar but being there you know Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world and so and there's just so much unique wildlife but there's and there's so much need for conservation in Madagascar but there's also so much need for the people so going there you just I felt like I just felt like I needed to help like I needed to do something I needed to I couldn't just you know, come on a vacation and then go home and like forget about it and like just watch some more documentaries. So when I got home, I was just thinking, how can I help? Like how, you know, what can I do? And when I had been in the north of Madagascar and Ankarana, I had seen a school that had a sign that said the Ladybug Project. And when I came home, I was like, okay, let me look up this Ladybug Project. What is that? And I ended up working with them on a literature review about education in Madagascar as a volunteer. And then just sort of stayed connected with my colleague, Dr. Kim Router, who was leading that organization at the time. And so when I finished that literature review, I was still like, okay, now what? Now what do I do? How, how, what else can I do for Madagascar? And in 2013, I read a paper that was called the Lemur Action Plan. And it was put out by the IUCN Species Survival Commission, the primate specialist group. And it was basically what do we need to do to save lemurs from extinction? And it had a very concrete plan laid out of this is how we can save lemurs from extinction. And I'm reading this plan and it had all these projects outlined. And I was like, awesome. I want to support these projects. How do I support them? And, you know, there was contact information for the authors and for how you might support a project, but there wasn't like a real concrete way where I could say, okay, yeah, I just, you know, gave money to help the bamboo lemur or whatever. So my like audience research and like, digital design brain kind of went in and was like, I feel like this lemur action plan needs a website. It needs like an online strategy where people can find out what, where help is needed. People can like come together and all support saving lemurs from extinction. And so, you know, I didn't have, I didn't know anything about the ICN. I didn't know what, you know, what, this lemur action plan was other than that it was a paper and it was trying to save lemurs from extinction. So (laughs) I emailed the lead author on the paper, Dr. Christoph Switzer, who at the time was with the Bristol Zoological Society in England and said, look, I, you know, sort of laid out a plan for building a website to help showcase the lemur action plan and help showcase all of the work that was outlined in that project. And I was sort of expecting the email to just go off into the ether and like, you know, this black hole (laughs) on the internet. (laughs) Right. But he wrote me back and he said, you know, I agree. We really need to put this out toward to more people to get more people on board to support, you know, how can we work together on this? So then I, we started brainstorming a little bit and I reached out to my former colleague, Dr. Router from the Ladybug Project, who she, I don't think she was with them anymore at that time, but she was now working in Washington, D.C., where I live, at Conservation International. So she was super excited about the idea, too, and wanted to help, like, launch this into being. So her and I sort of crunched real hard for a few months and, like, got things together so that we could launch the Lemur Conservation Network website a year after the original Lemur Action Plan was published. So we launched in early 2015 
and started out as, you know, a kind of a funding guide for lemur conservation, um, listing lots of different organizations that small and big um, that work in Madagascar to say help save lemurs from extinction, doing all different types of work from like education for local people to, you know, managing national parks or helping support parks or, you know, alternative livelihood type of work. So it was trying to elevate the smaller organizations by giving them a larger voice because Madagascar is so large and like kind of spread out that, you know, there's small organizations that focus in individual areas, but they're not necessarily all working together because they're all over the country. And so it was a way to highlight some of these smaller groups that don't have like a big fundraising or marketing budget, but we can highlight them all together in one place. And we, you know, we launched on social media to try to get lots of support from volunteers and donors around the world and just anybody who's interested in lemurs and conservation. So that was 2015 and we are still kicking. <laughs> um, for the first several years, we were a project of the IUCN Primate Specialist Group. And in 2021, we became independent as a nonprofit. Oh, um, that, that recent. I had no yeah. clue. Wow, congrats. It's huge. Yeah. So the first like five years, we were it co sort of existing as an organization, but we weren't like official. We were under the arm of the IUCN Species Survival Commission. So it makes being independent is helpful because we can get our own grants and like, you know, manage, get take donations and things like that to support the work of, you know, maintaining the website and everything. So we also kind of expand behind beyond the website at this point where we have over 60 member organizations and this includes some zoos but mostly conservation organizations that are working in madagascar big and small local malagasy organizations and bigger ones like wwf and wildlife conservation society etc um it's a lot of really small local ones and we also on our site we have lots of educational materials and we have teaching resources and we have a Malagasy website also. Our Madagascar manager and some other Malagasy colleagues work on to be putting Malagasy language content out into, you know, online about conservation and lemurs and all of that. And we also um, just finished up a fun project with the IUCN SOS Save Our Species grant. And we did one part of that grant was this was educational materials for use by our member organizations around Madagascar. So we try to, you know, work smarter, not harder of like, if we can create educational materials that might work in lots of different locations around Madagascar, let's do that, like consolidate the effort into, you know, LCN, and then we can distribute the materials to other organizations for use so that every single organization doesn't have to invent the wheel. So we actually created a lemur species card game. So it's a deck of cards that has all the different, it has about, I think it's about 30 species and, you know, different facts about them. And it's in Malagasy, but with icons too, because a lot of, you know, local kids and stuff aren't going to read like scientific words and stuff like that. <laughs> so it's using icons for the different foods they eat and stuff like that and then we have a whole booklet of games that you can play with those cards and you know different games that you can play to learn about lemurs so we distribute these to our partner organizations in madagascar and then they you know facilitate playing the games with their communities so it's more resources for them so that they can be more effective in their work in their communities where they're working we have lots of fun stuff going on <laughs> always <laughs> I will say oh my gosh that is absolutely incredible so let's let's take this up a, a little higher now and discuss let's actually talk about the the animals themselves so one maybe what are some fun lemur facts that you know those of us who aren't primatologists that we probably just don't know I mean a lot of us are probably aware that you know Zabumafu might have was a lemur and that they're from like this island called Madagascar but a lot of us don't know, and that's totally fine. This is a very special group of animals. So yeah, please, like, like teach us about them. What are lemurs? What are some of them? Like, what's their conservation? And then, yeah, introduce us to Madagascar. Yeah, so, so lemurs are primates, for one. They are 
there's 112 species of lemur. This number oh, is actually grows a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like people think of like the ring-tailed lemurs, rough lemurs, you know, a few other ones that you see in zoos a lot, but there's actually 112 species recognized no species clue. of lemur now. I did no clue. <laughs> yeah. So they have a lot of unique physical characteristics according like from other primates, just to, what sets them apart is that they have their sense of smell is very unique. They have longer snouts and like wet nose. They're called strepsorines. So they have, they're wet nosed primates. They also have, a lot of them have good night vision. So they have this extra layer of tissue behind the retina and their eye that gives, gives them improved night vision. Um, and they also have a tooth comb, which is like an extra set of teeth that is like sits in front of its I don't know um, when we sh when I show you some pictures, maybe you can see it. But if you look up <laughs> lemur tooth comb, it's basically <laughs> like a few teeth sort of jammed together in the front of their mouth, and it's built for grooming. So it oh. makes them real easier for them to groom. There are certain species that have some really cool facts about them too, like the ii is a nocturnal lemur, um, and the ii was what actually originally thought to be a rodent because its teeth keep growing and it looks kind of crazy some people think it looks like a goblin or something like it's nocturnal it, it has like big ears and kind of like scraggly hair sometimes when you see it and one of its on one of its hands the finger one of his fingers is really long because it uses it to dig into the bark to get worms and insects and grub and stuff like that um so those are really cool um let's see the there's also black lemurs use there's evidence that species of black lemurs actually eat millipedes to get high <laughs> so there's actually like drunk lemurs out there like hanging out in the trees yeah and there's so many cool facts about lemurs if you go to our website we have like so much content we have like a top 10 facts about lemurs page and all of this stuff so tons of fun stuff there so what about their conservation so let's talk about them as you know like keeping them here on this planet so what are some of the biggest threats that they're facing and how are those being addressed are there solutions are there things being yeah tried? so so both not only what is the problem but also how do we fix the problem and can we fix the problem yeah so in Madagascar, you know, as I mentioned, it's one of the poorest countries in the world. And so, and the population is growing. I think there's 26 million people that live in Madagascar. And, and then the majority of them are under 25. Wow. So the population is growing and, you know, people need resources. And so a lot of the main threat, I think, like for a lot of wildlife is habitat loss and habitat change. A lot of forest has been cleared for agriculture, whether that's small scale farmers or large scale for commercial crops in across Madagascar. I mean, you see a lot of fires burning, mm. that the fires are being cleared to create agricultural land. And sometimes those fires will get out of control. And so even though it's illegal to start fires in national parks or protected areas, if there's no fire breaks or fire barriers around the national parks, then those fires can get it out of control and burn down the, the protected area too. And so that's one solution is that, you know, some organizations are working to create those protect those fire breaks and fire barriers. And that's also, it also works, you know, anything that you do in Madagascar has to involve local people. I mean, in to the, you know, to a million extent, like you, want to employ local people you want to be using local scientists and local conservation organizations and partnership is super important and so like even like you know there's an organization called planet madagascar that it's working to do a lot of fire breaks and they employ people in the local surrounding villages around the parks where they work the one main park they work in is ankara fonsica which is actually where the kokoral shifaka which is the zabumafu lemur lives and that was the first lemur species that i saw in the wild in the first park i went to so oh. it's close to my heart but you know they are employing local people to be working on the fire breaks and all of that stuff and sort of giving them incentive to want to stop the fires too other than habitat loss there's also several other threats poaching is one because for both for food but also for the pet trade the you know people are hungry and if 
you don't have anything to eat. You want a source of protein and lemurs are protein just like, you know, other animals in the forest. So it's understandable why if your family is starving, you would be hunting. But also the pet trade is a big problem in Madagascar too. And ring-tailed lemurs are the most commonly kept um, lemurs as pets in Madagascar. It is illegal to have lemurs as pets in Madagascar, but it's still done frequently. And people will take babies out of the forest and then sell them. And so maybe it's not the person who is taking it out of the forest that's going to keep it as a pet, but they are going to sell it because they're, they need money and they see this animal as something that people want. And so then they, you know, sell it to somebody or they keep it as a pet, maybe as a reserve for food later on when they, when things are low. And so, and then a lot of also this actually brings back to tourism is a lot of the hotels will often have pet lemurs at their facility or lemurs that were captured in captivity and then brought into the hotel or brought into the hotel grounds because you know, tourists like to see lemurs, they want to get their photo taken with the lemur. And so, you know, it's, it's always, you know, easy to say, you know, the, the lemurs in the US that are pets or in UK or anywhere else that have pet that are pets, you know, they probably didn't come out of the forest in Madagascar. But people seeing that, you know, oh, I have a, you know, taking a picture of myself with like, a lemur that maybe I see on the beach in Miami because it's legal to have lemurs as pets in Florida. That sort of just fuels this idea that people, you know, Americans and other tourists like to see lemurs, like to be able to hold it, take, take, you know, take a picture with it, pet it, whatever. So I think it that sort of feeds into the hotels feeling like they want to have lemurs, you know, at their facility, even if it's not, you know, a natural environment or they're not being fed proper diet and all of that so then you know other things that madagascar has big conservation issues one of them is climate change i mean i know it's sort of similar around the world but madagascar there's actually a famine in the south of madagascar right now and it's known as the world's first famine that's caused by climate change it's not caused by you know human conflict or anything like that it's caused by climate change there's severe there's been severe droughts in the south of madagascar for years and it just keeps getting worse and worse. And I think that that's, you know, because the locally the forests have been cut down. And so that's like causing more drought, but also internationally, it's just sort of all culminating in then this severe climate change. And when you talk to local people, when you're there, it's like, they know there's climate change. They've been seeing the climate, you know, get worse and more catastrophic and more severe over the course of their lifetime. So to them, it's like this obvious thing that's happening. Yeah. And as far as solutions, I mean, there are a lot of solutions. I feel like I have a lot of hope for Madagascar. I know it's easy to get, you know, there are so many problems. But when I, you know, I have traveled a lot, you know, in my graduate program now, I'm in for conservation biology, and we travel to conservation areas around the world. And I think one thing that struck me my last trip to Paraguay was that there wasn't a lot of local support for conservation and in Paraguay. And when I left that trip, I felt it made me feel like Madagascar is a success story, mm. which sounds crazy because lemurs are considered the world's most endangered group of mammals. And, you know, 98% of them are species are considered endangered. So how could Madagascar be a success story? But in some ways it is, and in some ways it's not. It's a success story to me because I see so much potential. There's a growing, a rising trend of local Malagasy people being involved in conservation, starting NGOs, you know, lots of Malagasy scientists, conservationists, people are really wanting to protect Madagascar, protect their homeland, and wanting to keep the wildlife there and there is a growing number of Malagasy people it feels like to me that are super involved and super excited and want to collaborate and want to make Madagascar green again and there's so many NGOs so many there's over 60 organizations that work with the lemur conservation network all over Madagascar there is a lot of support for conservation there are a lot of people like me that are standing up and saying we need to do something about lemurs and conservation in Madagascar. And there is a lot of us. I mean, there's not enough. We can always use more. But there is a good support system for conservation in Madagascar. There, you know, 
I think we need more government buy-in from the Malagasy government. I think that the more people can travel to Madagascar and sort of show that economic support through tourism, the more it's going to show the Malagasy government that this needs to be a priority and we need to make sure that there's places for people to come to. You know, tourists aren't going to come see an empty forest. And so I think it's just so important to acknowledge that there are successes in Madagascar. You know, there is a growing group of people around the world and in Madagascar, especially, who just want to save Madagascar's wild places. I mean, the other side of it is that, you know, Madagascar might be a success story in that way, but Malagasy people are still starving. They're still, you know, it's still one of the poorest countries in the world. And so all of this has to go hand in hand. We can't say it's success if there's a famine, if, you know, people living near the forest can't get, can't get by. Or if people don't see economic opportunity, they don't see opportunity for their lives to get better, or for their children's lives to get better. So all of this has to go hand in hand that, you know, a conservation solution is not a good viable conservation solution if it doesn't include the people, if it doesn't empower Malagasy people and, you know, give them good jobs and give them, you know, the empowerment, the control over their own, you know, country and, you know, the decision-making ability. But I think that we're heading in that direction and where people are working hard and making it happen. It's just always conservation is always a little slower than you want it to be, or maybe a lot slower, but (laughs) I think a lot slower. The momentum is there and I can just, I just see it's, it's, you know, I, I really feel like the momentum is there and we just need to support Malagasy people as much as possible so that they have the resources, they have the tools, they have the knowledge that, and they have the funding ability that they can, you know, make Madagascar green again and protect lemurs and all of the other wildlife that's there while supporting the people. Yes. And this comes to the next big segment of our conversation. So we have covered conservation tourism quite extensively on this podcast because it is one of my biggest ethos. It's one of my biggest. I believe in it so much as a solution, because just like you said, so so many things that this one concept or this one field can help with. And that is you said that Madagascar is one of the poorest countries. Well, (laughs) conservation tourism is a direct way of bringing money to the country and also protecting the beautiful green spaces that's still there where these amazing species of lemurs live so it's all wrapped up in one and also since i actually am i work professionally in the field madagascar is starting to get onto the radar of a lot of people's just I th- I'm my, ne- my next bucket list, you know, so many people have gone to Africa, they've gone to these other destinations, and they're like, where should we go next? And then as more documentaries come out, you know, the BBC has been fantastic of creating some of the most gorgeous Madagascar documentaries I've ever seen. And once you see those images, you're like, oh my gosh, this needs to be saved. This needs to be, these people need opportunity. How do we make opportunity? Well, let's give them real jobs. Let's give them everything that we possibly can as tourists and people that are, you know, conservation minded. How can we help? And this is a way that we can help. We can go see these animals. And with that, I have not had the opportunity to see them myself, but it's high on the list and you have. You have yes. gone multiple times. You have been to these areas. You've been to these parks. You've seen these species. You've done all these experiences and met the communities. And so could you possibly take us there? Take me with you. I'm currently going to be in a plane. Oh, <laughs> I don't even know the airline that flies there, but let's say we're on Delta right now. We are going over to Madagascar. So I'm in the seat with you. Take me on a tour. What is it like yes. to experience Madagascar? Awesome. Definitely. I'm going to share my screen so that the viewers on YouTube can uh, experience some of these. Yes. And everyone listening, I will have timestamps as well of every single slide. So if you're driving, it is okay. Just come back to the show notes and we will make sure that you are able to see this, this amazingness. (laughs) Yes. So as I mentioned, you know, there's, there's 112 species of lemur in Madagascar. So well, if you're planning a trip to Madagascar, you're probably not going to see 112. So you want to focus on what are the things you want to see the most? Are there certain 
species that you're super excited about? Are there certain places? Are you more into the rainforest? Or do you want to experience the Singhi, which is this photo here in Ankarwana National Park? Oh, it's Singhi. Like, what are we looking yeah, at? Yeah, so this is, there's a few different Singhi parks in Madagascar. So, and they, it's limestone pinnacles, like limestone rock formations that come out of the ground in these like karst landscapes. And they're pretty crazy. And the lemurs, you know, I think you've probably seen these on some of the BBC documentaries or, yes. you know, and you can see like the lemurs jumping between the ragged cliffs and, you know, licking their toes because they maybe like got stuck on a pointy rock face. But this is like a super cool landscape to go visit. And there's the Ankarana, which is this one in the north. And then there's also the Singhi de Bemaraha in the west, which is the, the, the grand Singhi, the huge one. And then there's also dry forest in the south west and also just in general in the west part of the country baobabs are you know madagascar is also really known for baobabs and they are amazing i have not yet been to the alley of baobabs but that is i've seen so many amazing pictures of that where it's sort of an alleyway of just like majestic baobabs on all sides but this is in a lot of the parks on the western side you'll be able to see baobabs in all different species and you also see Madagascar, Malagasy people love rice. It's one of their main diet staples. And a lot of people eat rice three times a day. And, or most Malagasy people actually, I think, eat rice three times a day. And so you'll see as you're driving throughout the country, it's sort of terraced landscapes where people are growing rice. And it's interesting in, in Madagascar, as you're driving around and experiencing the different areas, there's 18 different tribes that live in Madagascar. So, and they all vary on their dialect of the Malagasy language, but also the different architecture styles that some of them have different clothing styles. And so they're all like unique cultures. So it's a really interesting place to go, not just for the landscapes and the wildlife, but to experience Malagasy people and the very unique cultures in different parts of the country. So you could go to, you know, some of the areas I'll show you today have totally different cultures too. So, and I always, I mean, I come from an art background, so I always find the architecture of the houses in different areas super interesting. Yeah, I love how those are bright red, like the houses are bright red. So the soil must have what I'm assuming like high iron content or something like those were just yeah, I'm not sure. So, yeah, but yeah. They were like tall and, too. So like you don't normally see buildings that tall too. <laughs> yeah, you, you can get so many amazing pictures as you're driving through Madagascar. It's, oh, it's awesome. <laughs> so this photo actually is from Antananarivo. So if you're flying on that Delta flight, which I'm not sure Delta flies to yeah, Antananarivo, but um, maybe <laughs> on Air France or um, Ethiopian Airlines flies there. That's like a good one to fly in because it can be cheaper than some of the others. Ooh, tip. You will, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be flying into Antananarivo, which is the capital, and it's kind of in the central eastern part of the country. And a lot of people just stop over in Antananarivo, or it's called Tana for short, for, you know, just for your kind of layover before you go to the countryside. But there is a lot of stuff, cool stuff to do in Tana too. And it can be, I took a, a walking tour in the old city, the, my, my first trip to Madagascar, which was really pretty cool because you could see they just sort of share more of the culture of the old city which is up on a hill and there's a, a queen's palace up there and so it's really great way to get to know the city i feel like and get What's to know madagascar? the culture too an int good introduction yeah and just just for context wasn't madagascar a french colony so is there like yeah. a french influence then it was a French colony until the seven or sixties, I think. Oh, okay. So. And so there is some French influence. People speak French. If you speak French, you'll be good there. A lot of the tour agencies and the tour companies have English speaking guides. So it's not a problem. If you don't speak French, you shouldn't be super worried about it. And they'll even have, there's even tour companies that specialize in German and different languages. So you're pretty good no matter, as long as you can speak, you know, English, German, French, something like that. Yeah. So, and this actually photo photo shows some of the fires that I talked about. So as you're driving around, you might see also fires that had been set or landscape that you can tell has been burnt by fire. It's just something to kind of 
you'll be aware of. And maybe sometimes I think in the fall is when fire season is the most. So if you go then, then sometimes people say you see like a fog or you can smell it in the air in Tana. Mm -hmm. There's like no trees either. That was crazy. It was like nothing. Yeah. So this was driving through the central highlands, which is mostly not forest. There's some debate about whether it, I don't think it, it was probably all, it wasn't 100% forested in the beginning, but it was definitely more forested than it is now. But there's some, you know, research debate and research circles about what percentage of the of the highlands was originally forest and how much has been lost. So the first place I, I wanted to show to talk about three different areas of Madagascar that sort of will highlight different places you can go in Madagascar and where you can see conservation in action and sort of how you can be a conservation tourist is I feel like it's about understanding, meeting people, talking to people about conservation and visiting local reserves. Maybe you want to visit the national parks and everything and see like the big, the larger areas and the main areas, but also, you know, paying tribute to local reserves that might be smaller, but maybe it's supporting a local community. So as you're traveling and you want to see the main national parks, there's also ways to visit conservation areas, whether that's visiting conservation organizations that are working in the park or just seeing some of their work or visiting community run reserves, which might be smaller. In some cases they're not, but then you're supporting the people there that have, you know, dedicated their life to protecting the area. So the first spot I wanted to talk about is Ron Mufana National Park, which is about 400 kilometers south of Tana. It's about a 10-hour drive. You can break it up. A lot of people stop in Ansarabe, which is great for crafts. And you can actually stop in Ansarabe and visit some artisans that are creating crafts. And that's kind of a cool way, too, because you can pick up some stuff to bring home, talk to more people, and support tourism that way, too. So Ranamafana National Park was established in 1991. And it was one of Madagascar's first parks. And this was established by Dr. Patricia Wright. And she runs an organization there who's at the LCN member called Centra Valbio. And they have an amazing, amazing research station at the edge of the park. And you can see it here. Wow. That's it's so cool. So much, so much larger than you would imagine. It didn't start out this big, but in the last five years or so, they have built it up. And it's so freaking. people come from all over the world to study here and to research the animals and the plants in the forest and to work with local communities. So she is sort of groundbreaking for Madagascar. She's sort of the Jane Goodall of Madagascar in, in some ways because she really got conservation going in Madagascar and helped establish this park. And there's over, I think there's about 2,000 species that live in, that are endemic to wow. Ranamathana, including there's seven lemur species that live here. So if you go, you can see the black and white rough lemur. I think there's a couple species of bamboo lemur, or I know there's a couple. I'm not sure if there's more than two. I forget. There's also Milne Edwards chapacas, which are one of the nine species of chapaca. So they have amazing leaping ability and they can jump between trees, but they're super beautiful. They have black fur with white patches and when I was there, I saw if you go with an amazing guide, like in in that Madagascar's national parks, you always have to visit with a guide. It's part of it's part of why Madagascar is great, actually. Some people when they say, Oh, I don't want to go hiking with a guide. I'm not used to having a guide with me. I like just wandering around by myself. But I think actually why Madagascar is so awesome is because you have to have a guide. Because the guides are so knowledgeable. And, you know, I you could walk around Ranamafana all day and not see anything if you <laughs> didn't know what you were looking for. Look how dense that is. That yeah. is thick forest. I would have no idea how to find anything. And I love tracking wildlife. I could only you would have to have a guide. <laughs> yeah. And they'll they are they also communicate with each other. So if you go and you're working with a guide, they'll have like a a walkie-talkie or they'll call out to each other and say, like, oh, I saw Milne or Sapaka, they're heading east or whatever down this trail. So then you know, all the tour groups go and scut skitter over there to try to find them. And I was there when I was there. I was lucky to be one on one with my guide. So we kind of we were like, you know, sleuth through the forest because we were quiet. So there was one point when we were walking on the trail and a group of Milne Edward Serpacas just jumped right by us and they sat like I 
didn't even have my camera out. I had my phone and I was able to take like close up videos. Like that's how they close they were that I was like wow. taking photos with my phone from there, just like jumping across, you know, there was a couple of babies on the back and you know, it was just so amazing. And then of course, after we saw them, he called up other people were like, Hey, there's some Milne Edwards tobaccos over here. I got I got my special <laughs> solo time with them so <laughs> that's awesome yeah so you know it's always when you're hiking through the forest to be as quiet as possible so if you have a small group that's always good the bigger groups sometimes you don't see anything because you got too many people and if you if you're visiting Rana Fauna you could also stop by Central Valbai if you're a researcher you can stay there in their they have dorms and they have you know lots of research facilities and stuff like that I actually, I stayed there in the dorms, even though I wasn't doing research, but I wanted to sort of talk to them more as, you know, somebody working in lemur conservation and get to know their work a lot better. But there's also plenty of awesome lodges in Ranamafana. It used to be, you know, back when Pat Wright first went there, it, there was, you know, very basic facilities. But at this point, there's lots of great lodges and lots of amazing tour guides. During COVID, actually, you know, when tourism was shut down, the Ranamafana Guides Association got together with Central Ohio and Pat Wright and this woman, Jesse Jordan, who was who stayed in Ranamafana during COVID. And they put together a way for them to give virtual tours of Ranamafana during COVID. So they're able to still support their families and Central Ohio and all of the other conservation organizations in Madagascar were so integral during that time because they you know, collected donations and used their funds to provide food and resources for local people because they, you know, these guides, and that's their life, you know, they, and they're providing for their whole family. So if there's no tourists coming, they don't have any food. COVID came at a really bad time too, because in Madagascar, the busy season is like the summer and fall. And so during the winter or our winter, you know, January, February, March, there's not a lot of people coming. And so they sort of save up their money all year so that they can get through that that slow time and you know then they were kind of down at the end of their reserves by the time COVID came and you know there wasn't anything left and now there's no tourists for you know a year or two years like this it's it was bad but people like Jesse and you know Sandra Vobayo all you know having they have a platform you know to the rest of the world like as an American I feel like I have a platform to the rest of the world I can you know, try to gather support for people that don't have that platform. So I think that was a really an important part of conservation organizations to support the people that are there and and to use our voices to to yeah, amplify. Then what, what's the alternative? You know, like right. the guides, because I mean, not that I don't want to like put this, like impose this on them or anything, but in other parts of the world, I mean, your best guides were actually former poachers. Yeah. They are the ones that know the animals <laughs> the most. And if somebody's desperate, like to put it in context, like if somebody's child is starving and they're dying, you will do anything to yeah. feed your child. You know, like these are real life situations. And if poaching a lemur is going to feed your child, I mean, can you blame somebody? So yeah. it's just, I think sometimes we just have to remember that and keep telling ourselves that in conservation that like, just because someone does this doesn't necessarily mean they're the bad person. So to hear that there was other alternatives that creative alternatives that kept the guides employed, kept their families fed, kept them through the really hard time of COVID and Madagascar was hit very hard again, being in like the safari industry myself, like it was awful it was terrible what yeah. happened to that country and it took them even longer than most other ones to reopen because it just they just didn't have the resources to do all the testing all the stuff so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and their their like health system isn't great so they were worried you know and you know people in the conservation community were worried too they didn't want them to open up too soon and then have you know something devastating like it to spread all over madagascar would not be great so. Or even possibly to lemurs. I mean, they're not that yeah. far removed from us. So definitely. Happen? And there is, you know, there is evidence of disease transmission between lemurs and humans. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's evidence of COVID, but it's definitely they're primates. So it's it's possible. Right. And then the next place, like if you are in Ranamafana, a lot of people, you know, there's this road, the RN7, the Route National 7 that you go down from Tana. And you stop it on Sarabe and then you to see the crafts and then you stop at Ranamafana to the, see the rainforest. And then a lot of people keep going, keep going south, which is great. But 
A lot of people don't know that about 60 kilometers east of Ranamafana is Kianjavatu. And this is another amazing conservation destination and it's so beautiful um gorgeous <laughs> yeah so this is i love this photo so much it's a view from the key in javatu field station which is a field station of madagascar biodiversity partnership so it's only an hour it's probably about two hours from ron mafana and madagascar biodiversity partnership and conservation fusion they are based out of omaha nebraska but they or their founders are in omaha nebraska but they have local staff working in in Kianjavatu and in I think five other areas throughout Madagascar too but this was the one station that I visited and it, it was so beautiful Is and they were doing I think it was midday so it was probably oh. yeah or I'm trying to remember that's a good question I'm trying to remember <laughs> when when we got there it might have been I don't think it, I mean <laughs> we didn't get up at like five o'clock in the morning or anything so oh, nice yeah the lighting is amazing and they're doing so much reforestation in this area so because in Madagascar there's a lot of forest fragments so there's you know national parks or different reserves that are protected and then there's a big gap between all of them mm. and so it's you know in order to have the forests be connected then you have better the animals are healthier because they can travel between the forests and you know have babies in different troops and all of that and so Madagascar Biodiversity Partnership is doing some reforestation between a couple of different forest fragments in the Kinjavatu area and they have planted millions of trees and they're doing it all with local community support it's so impressive. I visited their one of their a couple of their nurseries. So they they are a real awesome model of working with the community. They get, you know, over years, this didn't happen overnight, but getting working with local communities and the president of the, you know, villages and getting their support. And you know, they're employing, you know, giving jobs to single mothers and to families or to, you know, parents and so that you know, once, you know, a couple of villages started doing this and being part of the reforestation program, then other villages were like, well, wait, wow, they're, you know, they're doing pretty awesome because they're working on these reforestation projects and they're making money. And Madagascar Biodiversity Partnership also has a conservation credits rewards program. So, you know, people get paid to participate in the, in the forest, you know, in the tree planting activities and all of that stuff. But then they also get a conservation, conservation credits, and then they can pick out different things that they want to get with it, whether it's a bicycle or solar panels for their house or the, you know, a fuel efficient stove or something like that. So that then they keep coming back and back to do these, you know, tree planting activities and they're getting rewarded. They're getting something out of it and they can see, you know, that, you know, their lives are being improved. And conservation fusion is the education side of this puzzle. And they work with schools and local communities and they have girls and boys scholarships programs where they're supporting school isn't free in Madagascar it's not super expensive but if you're making you know less than two dollars a day every dollar is a big deal and they also just have lots of they provide lots of school resources and books and they work with the local schools and teachers to get them supplies and they also do a lot of they produce a lot of books in Malagasy because you know it's hard to find books in Malagasy. There aren't that many, you oh, know, wow. children's books and stuff like that. And so mm -hmm. creating books that are about, and books that are about local people, like, you know, about Malagasy people and stories that they can relate to in Malagasy. And so it's really, Conservation Fusion does really awesome work too. And it's a really great partnership, I think. And it's a super fun place to visit because you can see all this work firsthand. And that is always, I don't know, I guess I'm a conservation geek. I just love seeing like, the real, like the actual, oh, I'm yeah, all the, the real <laughs> stuff <laughs> happening. But you can also, they have, because Madagascar Biodiversity Partnership does a lot of research, and they also, they have collared, put radio collars on IIs hmm. in this area, in this forest. Oh, and cool. so it's kind of the only place I think you can be ethically guaranteed or pretty much guaranteed an II sighting because well, there are other places where you can see them too pretty easily. But usually those are places where it's not clear whether the animals are were taken from the forest. And so it's uh -huh. more of like a tourist situation. But in, in Kianjabatu, you know, the IIs are living their best freest life where they were before. They just have radio collars on them. And so the field assistants will take you out and you can try to find them. I mean, you have to go at night. So when I went, it was, it just seems crazy to me. I mean, I guess 
people that do nocturnal research to scientists probably are like, why is she saying this crazy? Because <laughs> I do this every day, you know? But I mean, you're like walking and, you know, animals don't stay in the hiking paths. They're not right. like, oh, let, we need to make sure that we're hanging out near this hiking path because, you know, Lynn's coming today and right. she wants to see us. Like they're wherever they are. And so you're, we were like, you know, hiking around on this mountain at like midnight from like midnight to two o'clock in the morning or something with like a big, you know, radio system and trying to find where the, the beeping was coming from and like where this I.I. is. And then, you know, you're sitting there in the dark and you're like, okay, there's an I.I. somewhere really close to here. Can anybody find the I.I.? You, know, you kind of have to like, <laughs> and it's dark and you have flashlights, but like, you know, it doesn't necessarily want to be seen. Right. I didn't know you were coming. You know, so then you're kind of everybody is just staring around looking for the eye in the pitch dark, like while balancing on like tree limbs and stuff, trying not to fall down the mountain. <laughs> Sounds but, like an adventure. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm, of course, the, you know, the American who's not used to like being in the heat and not used to wandering around forest at night on hills, you know. <laughs> so I'm just like panting and sweating and all the <laughs> Malagasy guides are like, what's wrong with that lady? You know, right. <laughs> yeah. And then going to this image, so it looks like we're looking at a tree nursery and then two beautiful smiles here of two children that have two trees. So that, yes. that's amazing. Yeah, they do so many community reforestation projects. And so, and they involve everybody in the community and just get everybody involved. And so it's, it's I always love seeing their photos. Like if you want to follow them on social media, they're always sharing like <laughs> awesome photos of people participating in amazing conservation stuff. And planting trees all the time and I don't know it gives me hope and what, about, what like a that. cool concept I've never heard of that where it's it's like it's a game slash almost like a not like a bartering system but almost like instead of giving people just straight up money it's like to do real conservation action you get real things in return like that's a crazy cool concept I'm surprised that we don't see that in more places clearly it's working like yeah and people ah. do get paid too, but then they also get like, it's like bonus, you know, stuff that you can work towards, you know, because if you okay. give somebody money and they just need, you know, they're going to use it for their day to day, but then to get this extra, you know, solar panels and stuff. And then that means that the kids can study at night and stuff like that if they have electricity. So it's like something to work forward, look forward to and to work towards. Wow. Yeah. It seems and like a good, a really good model. Yeah. And then recreate the force at the same time. Like, yeah, it's so cool. That is, that's phenomenal. Conservation fusion. Yeah. Okay. I definitely gotta, I gotta look them up. Madagascar, Madagascar Biodiversity Partnership and Conservation Fusion. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And you can stay there. They don't have like tons of tourist facilities there. It's basically a village and then, then you know, the, the field station, but there are tent sites covered and they're, there's also a volunteer program. So they have, oh, nice. You know, facilities for the volunteers to stay in and you can, you can stay there. They don't, you know, have super robust tourist facilities, but I mean, I stayed there one night and it was amazing. And you can either contact through by Madagascar Biodiversity Partnership to do that, or they also work with a tour company called Za Tours. And so they'll, you know, bring you there and arrange it and all of that. So it's definitely possible to stay there, but it is also only, two hours from Ranamafan. So if you were staying in Ranamafana, you could always do this as a day trip too. Oh, cool. Awesome. But then I guess if you want to see the eyes at night and balance on tree limbs in the middle of the forest. At I mean, I know then, I do. <laughs> I think you have to stay overnight for that, obviously. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm so game. The, just the opportunity to see a wild eye, like, oh, that's, that's, I don't know. That's like next level. That's like next level of just amazing opportunities. So yeah. For that, I will fall down multiple limbs of trees if it means that I can see it. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> it was definitely very cool. It was a super highlight of that trip. So next, I wanted to go a little bit further south in Madagascar to the Anja Community Reserve. So this is about three hours south from Ranamafan. So if you were going to Ranamafana and then to Kianjavatu, you would go, you know, back to Ranamafan and then a couple, three hours south down that same road, the RN7. And the Anja Reserve is actually a community run reserve. This is another total success story for Madagascar. So <clears throat> the Anja Reserve was created by a local community who decided 
that they had a forest near them where lots of ringtail lemurs lived and they had the idea that they wanted to protect this forest and they wanted to start a place for tourists to come and they all the community agreed and they all decided to do this and they all got together and agreed to stop cutting down the forest to stop poaching the lemurs and they're protecting this whole reserve and it's one of the stronghold for ringtail lemurs in Madagascar now it's a super important place and it's a really cool place to visit and all of the guides that work there you know are part of the community and so you can hear about the story of Anja and you know feel like you are di- you are directly supporting this community when you go to the Anja reserve and you know money from the park fees and the guide fees go towards schools and other things that the community needs and it's also just a cool place to visit you can see in these photos on the left is the farmland in the area that you can actually see so the Anja reserve there's it's you're getting more into the desert area of Madagascar so you're out of the rainforest that was Ranamafana and Kianjamatu and now you're heading more towards the south and more towards the desert area and there's a lot more like rocky cliffs but there's still still farmland that you're passing by the photo of this farmland was actually taken from actually the same place I think where both of these photos were taken so on the right oh, really? you see a photo of the rocks with the ring-tailed lemurs jumping between the rocks and then on the left there's a photo of farmland and there's a spot where you once you get into the reserve and you sort of climb up do some rock scrambling I recommend not wearing sandals I was wearing sandals because I thought you know oh it's just gonna be a small hike you might want to <laughs> wear hiking shoes <laughs> um and you can scramble up and climb up onto the top of these big rocks and then you can see ringtail lemurs kind of jumping across and you can see the forest patches and forest areas too and then on your on the other side you see the beautiful rice landscapes and rice fields and it's just a really picturesque area and there's a you know there's several different hikes you can do within the reserve there's um a lake or a water area you can see the ringtail lemurs you know going up to the water and there's lots of different troops of lemur of ringtail lemurs in this area when i was there they were there was new babies Uh-oh. um so and some of them are a little more apt to get close to you than others just depending on the troop and like where they're located the ones that are like closer to the you know entrance are used to having you know people walking around all the time so they're just like whatever I'm gonna hang out here next year (laughs) and the other ones might be you know a little more up in the forest so you're sort of seeing them jumping up around you know in the forest above you there's even like cactuses there so I have some photos of ringtail lemurs hanging out on like the typical like cactus paddles and I don't know it's just a really cool place to go and it's even more cool because you know that it's a community run reserve this was initiative founded by local Malagasy people who decided this is what we want to do with our land and this is how we're going to support ourselves and it's a win 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 because it's win for the community it's win for the animals and the you know wildlife and it's also win for the tourists because you get to see all these awesome ringtail lemurs and it's right off the rn7 the main road that a lot of people travel down so it's a super cool place to visit definitely a must must stop yeah, that's amazing. And I have to ask, I wrote, I wrote this down. So with this very tantalizing, beautiful rice fields and stuff, is there much conflict between farmers or just, you know, the, the agricultural community, part of the community and lemurs or other species that might have their eye on the agricultural land? Is, is that really a thing or yeah? It's not really a thing. I mean, I think I have heard of in northern Madagascar, where there's vanilla, some lemurs living kind of in the vanilla like farms and whatnot. I don't think there's much conflict, especially in Anja, because the communities want mm-hmm. the reserve. They're making money off of the reserve. So it's like, but I mean, for the most part, I think the lemurs are staying in the forest. They're not like hanging out on the rice. I mean, I've never seen lemurs hanging out on the rice fields. I don't know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, just just curiosity because it's definitely a big issue, you know, in, in other parts of the world with primates and agricultural land because a lot of primates figure out like, oh, your fruit is amazing. I love that piece of fruit just as much as humans do. And, you know, it's a big problem in a lot of places. So just out of curiosity, this is the first time I've ever seen ringtail lemurs or lemurs of any sort right beside agricultural land and i'm just like whoa yeah is that a thing like does that exist here so it's really cool to hear at least in this area that the tourism dollars are 
significantly more enough that if there is any sort of raid, you know, crop raiding, that it really isn't a big deal. Yeah, that's another thing that's made me think of that is that a lot of the reforestation projects, like especially I know the one that Madagascar Biodiversity Partnership works on in Kianjavatu, and I think a lot of the other ones too, is that they sort of plan for that. So when Mm -hmm. they're doing reforestation, they'll have an outer buffer where they have like the crops for people. So maybe the fruits that people want to eat or the whatever the crops that the people want. And then so that that those trees can be used by the communities so that they're not needing to go further into the forest where they've planted more of the native trees that the animals are looking to to use. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of if we can reforest in that way where we have people in mind already that we're not just saying oh it has to be perfect and pristine for the animals just acknowledge that people need to use these resources too and build that into your reforestation plan i think that is a really great solution no wonder why you have so much hope like this is another (laughs) reason why i was so excited to sit down with you because me being in the conservation world but not a madagascar expert by any means almost every single headline is bad it's negative it's like people are suffering people are dying no one has money no one has food all of our lemurs are being lost and then you tell us stories like this from on the like on the ground like this is actually what's happening yes all that stuff is true but let me tell you what's actually i'm seeing and that's powerful that just i mean it it is a story of hope yeah i mean it takes a long time like you don't just plant a forest (laughs) in a day you know so (laughs) <laughs> it's it is a long term strategy, but I think that we're going in the right direction. So this is this was my guide Adrian. He's one of the guides at Anja Reserve and in part of that community. So and it, you know this was the same exact spot that I took the other photos, and you know it's just a beautiful spot to just sit up there on the rocks and you know see the surrounding area get a lay of the land and watch lemurs jumping on rocks on cliff faces i mean it's amazing and then on the right here you see ringtail lemurs more up in the trees eating some leaves and flowers but it's a really cool place and then i wanted to mention too another forest which is only five kilometers from anja it's another community forest called sakaviro and that most people don't know about sakaviro And I only heard about Sacaviro because I guess I like to do a lot of internet sleuthing. (laughs) You'd be the expert, wouldn't you? (laughs) A friend of mine, Dr. Tara Clark, had studied the ring-tailed lemurs in this area in Anja. And I was reading her papers and it said that she also went to Sacaviro. And I was like, reached out to her. I'm like, I'm going to be in that area. What is Sacaviro Forest? Can I go there? I like to go to places that like people don't go to as much just to find out what they're about. and like. I don't know. I like to push myself. Sometimes I regret it. I'm like, why am I doing this to my, cra- <laughs> to my crazy self? But so Sacaviro is only about five kilometers away. I will say that my driver was not so thrilled that I insisted on going because that he was like, I don't know that my car can make it up this like, you know, dirt path. And he, once we got up there, he like made me take a picture of him with his car to like show that he could prove that he could do it and get around <laughs> the boulders and stuff. And he was like putting it on his Facebook page and stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> and you know even my guide adrian was like i don't know it's not that easy to see the lemurs in that forest and i said i don't care if we don't see lemurs that's fine i just want to go see what it's like and be able to tell my friend tara that i went to sacavira forest too so we drove up to the area after we got over the boulders and took a picture of my guide Zena, <laughs> you know standing in front of his victorious car and um they we had to go talk to the village because they don't get a lot of visitors but they do have like a a center of to take tourists and you know my guide communicated to them that we wanted to go see the forest and you know the whole village came around all the kids all Mm -hmm. the families and so they sent me with a couple of guys from the village the community and we went on a walk to go see the forest and you know i think in Madagascar when you're traveling sometimes you're just like you're not even sure what you're getting into but as long (laughs) as you trust your guide the guy that you're you know you hired to take you that you know you just have to put your trust in them because you probably don't speak I didn't speak Malagasy or the dialect that you know the people in the village are speaking so I just have to trust that my guide has my best interest at heart go for a walk and it was amazing like I felt so special I felt so honored to have them show me their forest we went to a part of the forest where they speak to their ancestors 
and they asked permission from the ancestors to show me the forest and then we went to another area was amazing it was actually caves that the community and their ancestors had lived in to try to hide from the french when the french were there and they showed me like where people would cook in this cave and where people would bathe and so it was just such an honor to experience this with people there was also a remains of like a jesuit church or something i'm kind of forgetting it some kind of church that had been there kind of up on the cliff or up further up and so i guess you know people missionaries had come at one point and you know the remains of that church were there they weren't you know the church was no longer happening but it was just so interesting to hear from people in the community about this place their home you know and it was such an honor to spend the day with them and we did see some ringtail lemurs. They kind of like jumped away immediately because they're, you know, they're not used to humans as much as they are in Anja where people are coming there all the time. But, it, you know, I was happy that there was, there was ringtail lemurs there and the community assured me that they, you know, they weren't trying, trying to protect this forest and they wanted more tourists to come to see it. And I had, they had me sign a guest book at the end mm-hmm. and I was the only person there the whole year. Wow. So it was it was amazing experience. I felt really honored to see the Sacovira Forest with this community. And it, I think the part that stood out to me the most was like that cave, seeing where, you know, just feeling that experience of where they were hiding from oppressors. So that was just such an honor. Mm. And so I think that my takeaway from this is like, there are so many nooks and crannies. There's so many places. There are so many communities that want to welcome you. And they, in Madagascar, people are so kind and so welcoming. And they are so love their country and they love where they live and they want to share it with you. They are honored that you came from so far away to see where they live. And they want to tell you about their culture and they want to share the experience with you and show the wildlife and talk about the area and history and all of this. So it's just, I think if you go to Madagascar or anywhere, like with an open heart and just see what you experience. I've said it so many times on this show because I've now been oh, quite a lot of places and I'm all, I always go for the wildlife. So of course, like if I would take this amazing trip with you, we are going to go see lemurs, but just like you, I guarantee that that moment is probably would be one of my favorites, like meeting the community, meeting the people. It's always, it's always the people. It's my guy. Mm -hmm. It's these cultures. It's this, just these other humans. Because I've come to find, I mean, I don't understand why. Maybe it's just because media just loves to blast other areas of the world and make everybody else seem bad. But there's been very few instances in my life where I would quote, like, quote unquote, call anybody bad or like assholes or anything. I've been Mm -hmm. so many places and everyone is welcoming. It's amazing. Everybody is welcoming. It's, It's so rare that somebody isn't just willing to give you everything just because like you said you you came just to see their home like their wildlife and that's what always moves me sometimes sometimes to actual tears and I don't get you yeah. know but these experiences are so deep and you are and like just like you said like every single line of like your comfort zone that you thought you had is immediately blown away and you're yeah. like well we are in new territory okay <laughs> <laughs> so who am I right now I don't know um right <laughs> but no that that's that sounds like unbelievable experience and phew, yeah yeah and actually they also remembered my friend tara they were like (laughs) oh yeah they and they told me about it without me even mentioning her they were like several years ago there was this canadian scientist who came (laughs) (laughs) and i was like i know her (laughs) and they were like she studied the lemurs so it was it was awesome (laughs) wow that's beautiful it's a beautiful story yeah so the next place we want to take you to is further north so we had been heading down the rn7 to we got down to anja and sakaviro but i want to take you further north in madagascar to marajeji um this is called the saba region of madagascar so you would fly from tana into sambaba which is on the water on the northeast coast and then there's two national parks in that area or 
protected areas, large protected areas, Marajaji National Park, which is featured in this photo, and also Anjana Haribe Sud Special Reserve. I went to both of them, but I'm going to focus on Marajaji and some other local reserves too. There's some really awesome, you know, like everywhere in Madagascar, there's amazing guides that you will meet. And a lot of them have such awesome stories and are doing such amazing work on their own outside of you know, their regular, you know, tour guide or forest guide job. So Marajaji is pretty awesome because I I don't know about you, but I love hiking, but I especially love hiking when I don't have to be camping. <laughs> yeah, I live right outside of Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. So yes, I agree. <laughs> so like, you know, I love the hut to hut camp hiking experience where you don't have to bring a tent on your back. You don't have to, you know, you're staying in a bed. It doesn't have to be the most fancy bed, but it's got a roof on it. Yes. You know, <laughs> that's not made out of tent material. And so that's what Marajeji offers, which is amazing. And it's one of the best places for hiking in all of Madagascar. I think there's, there's a, a summit hike, which goes, there's three different camps that you can stay at that have cabins. And there's also cooking areas there and you can hire. So what I did and what I recommend actually is hiring a cook to come with you. You can cook on your own, but then, you know, I actually had some of my best food I've ever had in Madagascar in Marajeji and they like carried the food with them the entire way. Like, and I'm vegan. So I was like a little nervous, like, are we just going to be eating like cucumbers the whole time or something? (laughs) But (laughs) I was able to get like the most elaborate salads and pastas and, you know, curries. And, you know, I also hired Porter Mm -hmm. and I know it feels kind of like maybe a little bit lame. Like you don't want to be like, oh, I can carry my own stuff. You know, I'm like, I feel so spoiled having people carry my things, but like people you're paying them. This is a job for them. This is, you know, part of the economy and it's only going to be like a dollar a day or something like that. Like you can totally... And then you don't have to carry like eight bags of rice on your back. So <laughs> I will happily pay orders to carry all the food and to cook things if, you know, it supports them and they're happy about it. And it also makes me not have to carry like 80,000 pounds on my back. Yes. <laughs> so really it's a, another win-win situation here. Yeah. And like the first, everybody, when I, before I went to Marajeji, I was like, I got to get in shape. Like everybody says Marajeji is the craziest you know, high of elevation, hiking, you know, you're climbing up mountains. And I was like, really scared and like trained for a while with, you know, just repeating in my head as I'm like running upstairs, like, <laughs> 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 I'm going to get to Madagascar and go to Marajaji National Park. The first, I will say the first two camps, if you don't want to like go insane on yourself, you could still go and hike camp to camp in Marajeji and stay the first two camps. Those ones are not too bad. If you're like a decent hiker, you'll be totally fine. And it's so awesome being in the rainforest in this area. This is the vanilla region. And so a lot of people know Madagascar is like the, I think the top vanilla exporter. And so when you're coming up to Marajeji, you'll see, you know, vanilla plantations. And even when I was there, when it was like top vanilla season and so a lot of people were we actually had a trouble getting porters for Anjana, Anjana Haribe sued because the villages were all rich they were like we don't want to carry your stuff we got so much money from vanilla right now we don't know what to do with it and I was like please carry my rice but um so it's just a really cool place to be it's really interesting and and then to spend a few days in Marajaji National Park at the cabins hiking between them you can see bamboo lemurs this is also where silky shafakas live Ooh. and silky shafakas are one of the nine species of shafaka they are critically endangered mm. they only live in this area and they're they're white they're all white shafakas the i think it's the males although i might be getting that wrong i do have some brown on there like a light brown on them so when i first saw a pair and one had some brown i was like wait what is the why is it why is it not all white? Like what I think of with a silky sapaka, but that's not abnormal. I was just used to seeing the all white ones in photographs, <laughs> but they're super cool. And they're so, they also get this pink pigment on their face. So some of them will have like bright pink faces and hands and stuff. They're just really cool. 
and they live in really high elevation and mountains. So if you want to see them, you probably should be doing some training. Coming out staying with me. <laughs> like do your stairs, you know, get in shape. Yeah. <laughs> but you could if you're staying, so you hike to camp one and that's pretty chill, like flat. And then you hike to camp two and it's it gets starts getting a little more higher elevation, but it's not crazy. But this is that's this camp two is where this photo was taken. So you can see great views, just amazing. And then camp three, there's like a crazy hike to get to camp three. And then there's another crazy hike to get to the summit. And we waited around for a while trying as my I also hired a Simpona tracker, which Simpona is the local word for Shafaka in this area and so he the tracker was wandering around the forest looking for the silky shifaka because they were like we don't want the foreigner to go with us because they'll just be too slow like we need to be like running through the forest looking for the shifaka so i'm like staying at camp too like just lounging around you know and checking out the local flowers and butterflies and they're like running around the forest looking for the shifaka for me to find and then they didn't quite find it yet, but I wanted to get up to, I was, I had planned to try to do the summit because I was crazy. And, <laughs> you know, you, you can't go to a mountain with a summit without like at least attempting, right? So, but we didn't leave until like afternoon to get to camp three from two. And so this whole time, my guide was like, we got to go fast. The sun's going to set. And it looks cloudy and it's going to start raining. We got to hurry up. We got to hurry up. And I'm like, oh my God, (laughs) I was like these, it was like, we were basically climbing up the mountain Mm. on like tree limbs and like pulling yourself up with a tree limb. Like my, you got to do some stretches and splits and stuff when you're at home before you go, because you're going to be like stretching your legs. Like you never thought were possible. Like (laughs) trying to like climb up mountains, basically. That's amazing. (laughs) And I must have complained so much, like my guide put up with me and my porter was just like, you know, I don't even think he was wearing shoes. He was like, (laughs) I'm just running up the mountain. I don't know what, why you're so slow. You can do it. You're good. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) And I'm just complaining like a crazy American. And we eventually get up there after I complain like 8,000 times. And it was, it was getting foggy and I didn't see a lot of the views that some people like that I've seen other people post from like different viewpoints. I'm like, it just looks like fog to me. But, and then when we stayed up there that night and then they kept tracking and they found a family so that in the morning we went up at like 5 a.m. We could go and find them because you want to get them before they start jumping around. So you got to get them when they're still asleep so that you know where they are. So you didn't just like hike all over the forest to find them and then they're jumping all over the place. So that was just amazing i did not make it up to the summit because i after that hiked from camp two to three it was like brutal and i was like done and Mm -hmm. my guide was like we have to try and then he's like well the weather doesn't look so good i think it's going to start raining and he's like so maybe we can't do it today i'm like yeah i think that's a good idea (laughs) (laughs) i agree (laughs) with that statement (laughs) yeah but Mm -hmm. it was so amazing to see silky safakas and i think that when i'm in madagascar and i think you know anywhere where you're seeing animals that you know are critically endangered or endangered and it's just like so amazing to see them in their natural habitat and to be like you know this place is for them like this place is protected like they are critically endangered and you know we need to protect the area and we need to you know work with communities and all of this conservation work but I'm seeing it now and it's okay now. And me being here is helping it be okay because I'm putting money into the economy and, you know, proving that tourists do want to come see this beautiful animal. And so, and it just builds up also, I think like the guides in Madagascar are so knowledgeable. They have so much scientific knowledge, knowledge. They might not have PhDs, but they know so much about the wildlife. And so just that they're able to share all that information with me and I can pass it on to you and like to everybody else. And so it's just like so magical to see, see lemurs in their like natural place and know that for right now, like they're good. Mm, yeah. And looking at this picture. So I swear I'm looking at like Jurassic World right now, like this <laughs> straight out of a movie with Chris Pratt, the new ones. Do you have any 
clue how old this ecosystem is. I mean, it just looks ancient to me. I mean, maybe it's not, and I just don't know any better since I'm not, I don't study botany, but like this looks very old. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I mean, Marajaji is an intact rainforest. It is, you know, it's primary rainforest. So it's, you know, some of the parks and some of the protected areas in Madagascar are secondary, which means that they were reforested, but now they're growing back. And that's great too. But, you know, this park is a primary rainforest. And so it, you know, it has been here for a really long time. So, so to just witness like, you know, right, like you said, like an ecosystem, like in place intact. And, you know, when you are on one of those overlooks in Marajaji, you do see surrounding area that has been turned to agriculture mm. and driving around. You are going to, in Madagascar, a lot of the area has been turned to agricultural land but the protected areas are there and we just need to do whatever we can to save them and to you know make sure they stick around and communities are supported and wanting to you know protect these areas yeah absolutely i wonder like how many species of plant was in that one photo Mm -hmm. it just looks so amazing and biodiverse and what a forest should look like in other words yeah so this photo on the right, I guess I have a habit of pairing photos of like wildlife with like the more human aspect. But yeah. um, on the right, we have the silky shabaka. Oh, so this was one of the that? ones that I saw. Oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah. On the left is actually a pretty awesome conservation project. So this is in the area surrounding Marajaji. And this is a fish farm that Lumar Conservation Foundation has has created with the community to give them alternate protein sources. So the Mm -hmm. organizations that work in this area are Lemur Conservation Foundation, Duke Lemur Center, there's some others too. There's an organization called Sapali Conservation for Poverty Alleviation International. And they work in this area with local women and communities to do sustainable silk farming and creating wild silk crafts and stuff like that. And their stuff is beautiful, like designer magazine like beautiful it's tanana i think is what they're what the brand that they're going under when they're selling it but they sell it worldwide like beautiful like wall hangings like table placemats and stuff like that so there's a lot of projects in this area that are kind of cool that i think if you're visiting it like you could reach out to like some of these people and say hey i want to see your work maybe you give them a donation when you're visiting and all that stuff so i think it's always cool for me to like learn about the different conservation projects that are going on and not just, I like visiting national parks and all that too. And also, you know, a lot of like Lemur Conservation Foundation supports the, the cabins and some of the tourism infrastructure in Marajaji. So that's super important for them. And then also in the other park here on Jahara, on Jana Harabe Sud, they provide and maintain the like camping sites and the the cooking areas and stuff like that too. So also in this area in the Sava region where Marajaji is, there's a couple of community run reserves, local, super small reserves that are run by some local guides. And I find these super inspiring. So this is Mm -hmm. Robbery Desiree and he has the Antana Tiambo reserve. So he is a guide for Marajaji National Park in this whole area and out of his own fruition decided that he wanted to protect a forest near where he lives and he wanted to he actually used his money from guiding and from helping with scientific research projects for you know researcher foreign researchers to purchase land and he purchased a reserve to protect it from being turned into agricultural land. So on the right, you can see this is him. He actually won the 2010 Seacology Prize Mm -hmm. and he was flown to California and had this big award ceremony for him. So this is a photo of him with that award. And on the left, you see him when I visited at his reserve. This was the tree nursery that he has there. And he's so he's using that to, you know, continue to grow his reserve and to plant crops that the like bamboo for the bamboo lemurs and things like that to you know keep the keep the area going you can get to his reserve through the town of andapa which is it's in the whole area you know it's i think it's between marajaji and assr the other one on you know you have to you would have to you know tell your 
guide or whatever in advance to like give him a call and you know arrange <laughs> to come out there but you know I saw so I took some really horrible photos of bamboo lemurs which I won't share because <laughs> it's like really hard to take but like he has these bamboo there the reserve has all these bamboo forests mm -hmm. so you're looking through like you know thousands of like bamboo trees at these lemurs like far away like it's not really easy to get a good photo of like <laughs> lemurs among lots of bamboo but <laughs> But it's super cool to see them. And I also saw when I was there some really tiny chameleons. Like I think the smallest chameleon in the world lives in Madagascar. And there's a there's a whole a whole bunch of chameleons that are like super tiny. So it's like to be walking around with Desiree Robbery and have him be like, Oh, look, here's a little tiny chameleon all of a sudden. <laughs> Yeah. Like I never would have seen that. I definitely would have <laughs> never seen that. So and it was so awesome to talk to him. He has a, a field office there and he showed me pictures of him with Dr. Russell Metermeyer when he had come through and he was so proud of having been to California and of whole, keeping this reserve and he also does a lot of outreach with his community and with kids and education and you know I think it's so important to support local people who have these initiatives that you know that's they're taking it upon themselves that you know I'm proud of my land and I want to protect this and make sure that this doesn't get turned turn, turned into farmland and I want to make sure that this is the home for wildlife and you know they're proud of it and to be able to go there and see them and talk to them talk to him firsthand like it was, it was really awesome and it also is like feels like an adventure because you're you know you're like I don't know where I'm going I'm going <laughs> to this small tiny reserve at the edge of this village like that's cool don't know what you're going to get into. There's no like big fancy brochure about it or something like mm -hmm. that or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it was super cool. And another one that I went to, a similar story. This is Jackson. He was my guide for the AASSR trip and in this area. And he's super friendly. He works with the Lemur Conservation Foundation a lot. And Dr. Eric Patel, who's like their head of conservation there and comes out to do a lot of silky spocker research. And so he recommended I work with Jackson and he's super nice guy and so when you're going to Marajeji you're walking through Jackson's village and, and from the park entrance and then you go to the park and so you know you're walking through there with Jackson and you know everybody's saying hello and you know it's just so and so nice and so after we went to Marajeji he showed me his reserve and so this reserve that he has is part of his family land but he's, you know, Madagascar, a lot of families have really big families, lots of yeah. children. So he's sharing this land with his brothers and sisters. So not necessarily everybody wants it to be a reserve, but he's protected as much of it as he can. And um, he's trying to grow it. And he's working with Lemur Conservation Foundation to, to kind of get some more land in the area to make the reserve larger and to do tree nurseries. And, you know, as we were walking around, we saw this adorable white little frog yes. just hanging out on a leaf as we were like hiking through the reserve that was wow. super cool and you know after we visited his reserve we he took me to lunch at his house and his wife like made a sweet potato stew for us and like it was just so awesome like to be able to be part of somebody's family just for like you know an afternoon and you know he his wife cooked for you know all the guides and porters and it was just I didn't probably know half of what everybody was saying but <laughs> it was lovely <laughs> love home experiences those are the most special I totally agree yeah and just like you know talking to Jackson and he you know he's just so proud of his area and of the people and you know of Marajeji and all they can do there and so to what you know I just wanted to you know support you just, I just feel like I just leave these places just wanting to support even more I'm like right. okay I'm already doing so much but what more can I do what can right. I you know how can I help Jackson and you know all of this so it's just really awesome to meet so many amazing people and see so many conservation stories like that's always what I'm going for like I want to have you know an awesome trip and like see awesome animals but I love finding those conservation stories and hearing people talk about where they live and what they're doing to protect the wildlife there and just you know the stories that they have right that's what our style is all about right that is yeah conservation tourism <laughs> yeah it's awesome 
So I think that's all I have for the little tour guide section of showing you all around or talking you all through all around Madagascar. Oh yeah, here we have this photo is um, not an area that I showed before, but I just love this photo and this lodge. It's called the Nature Lob Lodge and it's near Mount Amber National Park. This is in northern Madagascar near Ankarana where I showed you the Singhi. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, I love a good front porch, you know, yeah. looking out onto the forest. <laughs> Yeah, so let's, so that was a beautiful tour. Oh my God, thank you. As if I didn't want to go enough, like I, and also meet these amazing people too. And then be like, I know Lynn, do you remember Lynn? Yeah. You know, that's always like a, a really fun part of this too. But so let's, let's take this back to big picture. And maybe even COVID was an example of this. What, okay, two questions here. One, when it comes to the conservation of lemurs, how big of a role does tourism actually play in it? And is there other more important things? One. And then two, what would happen if tourism completely stopped and no other tourists were allowed to come for the foreseeable? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, tourism isn't a one, you know, one cure to heal the world yes. kind of thing. We need everything. But I think for Madagascar, it is really important because it, you know, it is a decent part of Madagascar's economy. And, you know, there isn't a lot of other sustainable pieces of the economy. There's, you know, mining and, you know, different agricultural things. But, you know, as far as protecting wildlife, you need a reason to protect it. And with a country that is so financially poor, you definitely need an economic reason to protect it. And tourism brings that reason. It also, it helps mobilize local people around it too. You know, if you're living around a forest, if you're living around a national park and you're, you know, you're somebody in your family as a tour guide and they're bringing in good money and, and they're also, you know, sharing that information with you and sharing stories that they hear from tourists about you know the world outside Madagascar and all of this stuff I think it just opens up opportunities for people and brings in some hope of like you know there is we can we can get by here because we have tourists coming in and we can and you know when especially when tourists come in and they just want to hear about you and they want to hear about your culture and where you live and if it's done in a not exploitative way that, you know, people are really just sincerely like loving your, where you live and loving your country and you can share that with them. Like, that's great. And then it also brings you income. So I think it's definitely a super important part. I mean, during COVID, like I mentioned in Ranma Fun and in a lot of other places too, you know, all the tour guides didn't have income, you know, and even the ones that work in the city, they didn't have income and especially in you know during covid it was also really hard because they put all the roads and stuff on lockdown so even locally oh, wow. people couldn't get around and so people you know living day to day like they're going to the market to get their dinner like and you're not allowed to be out on the roads like people were really really struggling even worse than they were before so conservation really had to step in a lot of conservation organizations were you know, you don't think of it's a concert, a lemur a conservation organization's job to like provide, you know, bags of rice for villages. But like, if they are people that you had been working with and now they don't have anything, like you need to do that. Like it's, it's the right thing to do, but it's also like, they're not going to be wanting to work with you when COVID's over. If you kind of left them high and dry. Right. Uh, Knowing that you had the resources to possibly help. Yeah. And I think that's it. It's like people, you know, even though in America or elsewhere, we do have our struggles and not everybody is like a millionaire, clearly. But, you know, we do have the power of having a larger voice or the ability to speak outside of our village, our community, and being able to like gather support more so than, you know, somebody living in a, a small village in Madagascar. Yes, and kind of extending on that a little further. So while 
I travel a lot more because I've made it my professional career, which I highly recommend anybody doing that. Yeah, I'm a little jealous. <laughs> During COVID, it was a little rough, but if that was that was like that for everybody in conservation. So that's not just my story. But maybe somebody listening can't travel to Madagascar. Maybe it's a finance thing. Maybe it's like they literally just can't leave where they are. Or, you know, maybe they're a mother. Maybe there's there's a lot of different reasons why this trip might be just inconceivable at least where somebody is right now so yeah. but what can what can we do like I, do, I don't know when I'm going to be able to get to Madagascar but I would love to support lemurs and and conserving this incredibly biodiverse one of the most important biodiversity hotspots really in the world so like what can I do what can somebody in India do or the UK or you know Chile, like what can all of us around the world do to make sure that this community is supported and that we keep our lemurs here? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot you can do and some of it is financial and some of it is not. So, you know, I think it's just about for one, I mean, I think just learning about lemurs in Madagascar and getting enthusiastic and wanting to share that information. I mean, it's, you know, the more people know about lemurs and think that they're awesome, the more support there's going to be. So. I think that's important in a way that anybody can help. You know, if you following different organizations on social media and like sharing those inspiring stories and that, you know, make you want to help, then, you know, that might inspire somebody else and have them want to help too. And you never know who you're going to reach that way. And I think, you know, our website, the Lemur Conservation Network was really built for helping people help. That was sort of my motivation for starting it. And I, it's still, my motivation to keep going is like, you know, I'm just one person, you know, and I can do what I can do to help, but I want to help you. If you want to help, I want to inspire you to help and also to help you figure out how to do that. So there's a how to help section on our site that lists a whole bunch of different stuff. So from, you know, learning about different organizations and finding one to support from volunteering, whether that's in Madagascar, which makes an awesome experience or from home, whether that's supporting an organization through, you know, for us, for the Lima Conservation Network and a lot of other organizations, like if you're an artist, like we have a store where we sell, you know, people's designs of lemurs and stuff like that on our items. And so, you know, if you want to donate photography or donate your artwork or, you know, partner with us so that it's a win-win type of thing where the artist is supported too. That's, a, you know, a possibility. I feel like there's always some way for people to help. If you think about what your skills are, I think that's the best thing is like, if you have a certain skill in something, like figure out how maybe that skill might be able to help you help lemurs. We also have on our site, a shop page, which doesn't just have our shop, but it has all different types of ways you can buy things to support Madagascar, including those, the Tanana silk items that I was talking about earlier and like different stores that are using that use employ artisans. There's another one in the St. Luce area that has lots of embroidery and stuff like that that's handmade by artisans. So any kind of way that you're supporting Malagasy people is supporting lemurs and conservation because if Malagasy people aren't supported, then lemurs are not going to have forests left there's also you know right now is the world lemur festival which is happens every october and the last week of october we celebrate the world lemur festival which culminates in world lemur day on the last friday of october which is october 28th and it's like an annual festival where we celebrate lemurs and we encourage everybody around the world to celebrate lemurs to share information about lemurs to like tell your friends and family be as annoying as possible about how <laughs> cool lemurs are and just like do whatever you can to like raise that voice of people who want to help lemurs in Madagascar and World Lemur Festival and the World Lemur Day is sort of where we like pack all that energy into is let's say this as loud as possible that lemurs are awesome Madagascar is awesome Malagasy people are awesome. Let's support lemurs, Madagascar, Malagasy people and celebrate too, because there's a lot to celebrate. So the photos that I'm sharing right now is on the left, you see Professor Jonah Ratsambazafi, and he is with GERP Madagascar, which is a Malagasy primate research group. And he is the founder of the World Lemur Festival and GERP 
founded it in 2014. It was the first World Namer Festival, and it was only in Madagascar. And so he just had this idea that we need to celebrate lemurs. And so after that first one, then, you know, the Lemur Conservation Network was launched and we tried to get everybody together around the world to celebrate the World Lemur Festival and this idea, spread this idea that Jonah had of let's all celebrate lemurs and celebrate lemurs for World Lemur Day. And so in Madagascar, there's, you know, the special tree planting events and then there's all these like parades and parties and festivals of people, you know, singing and dancing and crafts and learning about lemurs and, you know, scientific talks and all of this. And it's, it's just a really great time to focus our energies and just celebrate, but also make a plan. Like, what is our action? What actions are we going to take? Are we going to, you know, plant, replant this forest corridor? And we're going to teach all the kids about how awesome lemurs are and like get them into the forest to see lemurs. So and we also encourage zoos around the world and people around the world to celebrate. <laughs> so you can see it's like awesome. We get so many zoos participating in the bottom left. I think that's the Japan Primate Center. And they always do something super fun. And then on the top left, you have a photo from I think that's in Madagascar in one of the, the park areas up there. And so people are always dressing in costumes, sharing information and like just having fun and doing some fundraising or just you know, sharing scientific talks. It's just super fun. And we always have a huge push on social media too, where we're getting, we work with a bunch of artists for the last couple of years to do like a drawing challenge. So right now we're doing a World Lemur Festival drawing challenge the whole month of October. And so we've done this the last couple of years with this artist named Mr. Lemur, and he is super talented. And he has, he gets, he has so many followers and everything too. So he gets so many artists from around the world to like be drawing lemur species and drawing different species from Madagascar. And so it's just super fun to see artists and people learning about lemurs because they want to participate in this fun drawing challenge to like draw species. And then they're learning about them and creating social posts. And it's so cool. I love seeing artwork and seeing like kids drawing lemurs like my I got my niece to be she was drawing lemur species <laughs> during this festival so it's just so fun to see people around the world just like spreading awareness about lemurs in such fun ways like I feel like you know conservation sometimes isn't fun but let's try to have some fun <laughs> agreed girl agreed that's yes. why half the time we have a glass of wine on this show. It's like, <laughs> let's enjoy ourselves. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, perfect. So, wow, Lynn, oh my gosh, you just took me on this fantastic tour. And those tips were absolutely incredible. So I, I know I've, I've kept you for so long. This is just, I could talk to you literally all day, I feel like it. <laughs> And then, of course, we're going to be celebrating on the show. This is why we're sitting down World Lemur Day. So yes. this episode is coming out the day before because we always release on Thursday. So it's going to be like a 48 hour party for lemurs. And we're going to start awesome. the first thing on Thursday morning. We're going to start celebrating lemurs. And so, yeah, how can anybody like get a hold of you? Or can how can they also celebrate World Lemur Day or get in touch with Lord Lemur Conservation Network? I mean, everything. Yeah, you just yeah. do all the details. Definitely. Well, as far as World Lemur Day and the World Lemur Festival, definitely check out the hashtags. World Lemur Festival hashtag is what we're using for the drawing challenge. So if you want to see lots of fun artwork about lemurs, check out that hashtag. And then you'll also see lots of photos of like events around the world in Madagascar and at zoos. And, you know, sometimes people are just like they dress up as a lemur for Halloween because it sort of coincides. So Lots of fun lemur costumes. And, you know, we also on our website at lemurconservationnetwork.org, we have lots of information about World Lemur Day. And so we have an event calendar that we keep a list of everything that's going on that we know of for the World Lemur Festival, whether that's virtual talks or whether that's a zoo is having a special keeper chat or they're having, you know, a big party or something like that or any fundraising events. So that is a, kind of your one-stop shop for World Lemur Day is going to our website. 
and also all of our social handles. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. We got it covered. So <laughs> <laughs> definitely check out our resources. We also have tons of stuff for teachers and parents. It, we have a teaching a learn section on our site that has lots of fun activities. We have we have nine new lemur coloring sheets this year that are like these fun oh, illustrations of nine different species. So we try to add some new teaching resources and learning resources every year for World Lemur Festival. So there's always something new to check out. But yeah, definitely, even if you just like pop in a great Madagascar documentary tomorrow for World Lemur Day, and just like daydream about maybe going to Madagascar and just experiencing it through that documentary. I mean, the documentary is where I first found my love for lemurs. So maybe you'll find yours too. Totally agree. And one of the big goals of this show is to actually have trips to go see and meet these people. So maybe one day, I don't know, Lynn, maybe we're going to get together. And that we'll, would be awesome. We'll bring the Rewatology community together and we'll go. So I'm just going to plant the seed now. I'm going to just keep planting as many seeds as I can until I actually pull the trigger and make this. Yeah, happen. I'm but, in. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, Lynn, we're going to be partners in this, but... Lynn, thank you again so much for taking me on the most enjoyable plane ride ever because I didn't have to sit in a plane and yeah. <laughs> take me all across the beautiful island of Madagascar and these very, very special primates. So again, Lynn, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Wow. I want to travel to Madagascar even more after sitting down with Lynn. If we put a trip together to see the species and the people Lynn mentioned, you all will be the first to know. Also, tomorrow is World Lemur Day, which this episode is a celebration of, and the Lemur Conservation Network is putting on lots of fun line events that you can participate in. Please visit their website, lemurconservation.org, and LCN's active social media pages to get in on all of the lemur action. If you have a specific question you'd like to discuss about today's topic, head on over to the Rewatology YouTube channel and submit your question in the comment section of today's episode. Some of you have reached out and asked how you can support the show. Well, I'm happy to share that there are several ways to do so. Some zero cost ways to support the show include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the weekly Rewatology newsletter at the website, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support the show and help us keep these stories on the airwaves, consider making a monetary donation at Rewatology.com or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewatology love. At least 10% of proceeds from this podcast will be donated to our conservation partners. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Heather Valley, the show's audio and video producer, for making the show sound and look awesome and Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. If you'd like to see the Focusrite gear we use to record the show, head on over to Rewildology.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we'll rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.